We're getting a screen door for upstairs so we can open up the outside door and get some fresh air in and Moxie can be happy. He's happy anyway, but there's something about outside air that the cat enjoys to smell. So we figured out how to fit that and that should that should come in eventually this week. So we're looking at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. As we continue looking at goodness, this will be the last time likely that we look at the church at Laodicea. The Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Our Father, we thank you for this time that we have. We pray that you bless it and help us to apply it to our, your word to our lives. Father, again, please help those folks down in Florida as they're going through a hard time right now. And we'll thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at goodness, of course. Goodness equating to kindness. Kindness as far as loving truth and even to the point of rebuking, reproving, chastening because of truth. Again, not a popular subject, which is probably why the Lord's had us to dwell on it so much. I mean, we've looked at love for many weeks and why? Well, the world has this weird view of love that love is just all positive it's all ooey gooey rainbows and unicorns and if you dare criticize me you don't love me if you dare judge me you don't love me that's the world's definition and that's not god's definition at all we're looking at the same thing with kindness people say well kindness is just sweetness no it's not always sweetness some of the best things that you can do for people that you love is help them to see the truth now if they know what the truth is and they don't care then don't badger them certainly but one of the best things we can do is tell them the truth right if we don't tell people the truth at times no one else will and if we just sit around and say oh it's it's going to be wonderful it's going to be great then when it's not then we're just helping add to the problem i had that situation this week and i'm going to probably allude to it a lot because i talked to the gentleman for two hours but this uh, gentleman at this one church this church did not have a good start and the people that initially were there it's kind of a back and forth type of thing there may have been some good may have been some bad but their their pastor was not good i know because i know the man i went to college with him i saw him slide into uh, contemporaryism what have you and it's not good not good but most people, because it's the way it is, they just go along with it. And there's a good aspect to that. There's also a very bad aspect to it. And this gentleman's trying to restructure the church. He's only been there since the beginning, beginning of the year and has a hopeful spirit about it. But uh, I talked to him, and part of my conversation with him was a cautioning sort of thing because I know some things about it that he does, doesn't or didn't. My wife, too. We were up in Maryland when this church was started, and it's more of a church now than it was then because back then it was just a splinter off another, much like we have here, and a group of people deciding to make an assembly called a church. So 10 years later, 10 years later, yeah, you have that and this gentleman wander into a mess and didn't know it. So part of the conversation was talking about that. 
why? why? Why can't I be just, oh, it's wonderful. Oh, it's great. Because if I wasn't cautionary, it wouldn't be doing the man a service. I had with the church before this one that we were only there a year. And I've told you the story about the man that looked at me after we left there, realizing what that church was all about after we left there and that a man come up to me and said, yeah, I, in so many words, yeah, I uh, saw you were going to take that church and I knew the testimony of that church was da 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 da, which is the reason why major reason why we left. And I thought to myself, why didn't you say something? Right? <laughs> they didn't. And so our family, I'm not saying I would have listened or wouldn't have. I'd like to think I would have at least considered what he said and investigated it. But when you have something like that and you do not open your mouth and you could be a help to a person, you're just helping to contribute to the hurt that that person's going to go through down the line if you say nothing and do nothing. You say, well, they're not going to listen to me. You don't know that. You can assume that. You can assume it all the day long, but you don't know that. And if they don't listen to you, you can say, I tried. I tried. There's nothing wrong with warning people out of love, warning people out of kindness. That doesn't mean we go out of our way to insert ourselves into random situations and get in everyone's business. That means when we have an opportunity to speak up, we should. So I guess that's your first sermon for the evening, but regardless, the world does not see that as kindness. Yes, most of the time you warn people, and my wife and I have seen it here, just as we've seen it everywhere. Yes, most of the time you speak up, you warn people, they won't listen to you because most people are full of themselves and they think they know everything and no one else knows anything. Yes, I get it. I get it. We're all full of ourselves. We're all prideful and we have to fight that pride, don't we? I remember when I, my parents didn't know anything when I was a teenager, right? But I was full of myself, full of pride. I wish I would have listened to my parents more than not, regardless. Kindness, because we love the truth. Christ shows us this. We've been studying this through the three aspects that the Bible gives us. He cleansed the temple. He corrected the Pharisees. And he is correcting and encouraging the churches in the book of Revelation. We're looking at the seventh of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 3, the church at Laodicea, the church that needed to make up its mind, right? And we're going to finish this up, Lord willing, this evening. So the Bible says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So if you remember, three great reasons to choose Christ and follow him according to his word. Three great reasons to choose Christ and follow him according to his word. He's the Amen. That means he is faithful capital F, it is part of his essence. He cannot but be faithful. There is no other option for Christ. He is always going to be faithful to us. You say, why is that important? It's important because you and I, if we're honest with ourselves, we are not always faithful. 
It is not part of our essence. We have to fight to make it part of our character, to make it part of ourselves, to be faithful. He is the faithful and true witness. That means that everything that he gives us is true. Everything that he gives us is true. And again, I'll allude to the fact that we need to stick with the King James as God's preserved word for English speakers, not fall into the confusing game that is out there amidst the different versions. Don't fall into that lie saying this is easier to understand. It's not. I've read, I started, my first Bible was in NKJV, a New King James. My second Bible was even worse. It was an NIV. I still have these Bibles I could show you. No, I did not tear them up and burn them. <laughs> it was an NIV. And then I got, I think, to some point before that one fell apart. It was an NIV King James Parallel Bible. But then I learned why we should use the King James and have been using it ever since. And it was the same time my parents learned the same thing. It takes work, whatever version you're using, to study through it. You have to use a concordance on any version you use to study through it. The King James takes a tiny bit more work to understand, but it's worth it because it is the best. Do you want a Bible that leaves verses out? Because that's what the other versions do. And I can show you that. Do you want Bibles that leave out part of instruction for prayer? Like the other versions leave out the so important thy will be done out of Luke chapter 11. That's how we learn how to pray. Why do so many people command God in prayer? Is because they don't have in their Bible, so called, thy will be done. That's part of it. If it's not there, you can't know it. If it's not there, you can't read it. And that's just a small part of it. The King James uses better texts for the interpretation, or the translation, I should say. So why would we waffle about the issue? Why not use what's best? Get what is the preserved word of God for our language. Because we value the word of God that much. You say, well, so-and-so church uses this, so-and-so pastor on TV uses that, so-and-so college does this, that, and the other. Yeah, I know, I get it. They refuse to see the issues for one reason or another. Some of them are getting paid to do what they do with the Bible versions. I can prove that too. Why not use what's best? Doesn't make sense to do anything otherwise. Christ is the beginning of the creation of God. He is God Almighty. He is the creator God. Three great reasons to follow Christ. Choose Christ and follow him. Four great truths then about lukewarm Christianity. Jesus says, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would thou wert hot or cold. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither hot or cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy, my mouth. And it goes on from there. So, Jesus just wants us to make a decision. He says, either follow me or don't. Follow me or don't. As much as it hurts your heart and mine, it's better that we see and know as much as we can the hearts of individuals through the actions, you know, by their fruits, you shall know them whether or not they're going to choose Christ instead of people pretending 
pretending. And folks, we have a lot of pretenders out there today. I told the gentleman over the phone, one of the great things I've learned, and this was not my intention, folks. This is just something I've learned over the past several years of ministry as we've sought to help people follow Christ with discipleship, showing uh, God showing us the, the vital importance of that, and the Bible study books, having the thrive in relationship with Christ and his word, applying his word to our lives, focusing on studying to apply his word. As you focus on those two things, which discipleship's just all about, learning about the word of God too, you come eventually, and it might take days, months, or years for people to show their true colors, but you find out what's going on in their hearts and minds based upon how'd your Bible reading go this week? What did God speak to you about in your Bible reading? Would you like to sit down once a week and study the Bible together? How people react to that is very telling. The people that want it are the people that try. I'm not even saying the, the people that just dive right in and start consuming the word of God. No, no, it's the people that try. And the people that don't want it, you know the people that don't want it. You find out very quickly. Jesus says, make a choice. Make a choice. Four great truths about lukewarm Christianity. The first is that it disgusts Jesus Christ. He says, I, I will spew you out of my mouth, meaning I will vomit you. I will throw you up. You make me sick. Do you want Jesus to say that about you? Or do I want him to say that about me? I, I hope we sit in the pew and say, certainly not. As I stand here and say, certainly not. <laughs> You don't want Christ to say, hey, there's, the, there's that person that made me sick because they just kept waffling about with their Christianity. They kept putting other things first instead of me. They weren't willing to suffer persecution for my sake. And so we talked about the various warnings that Christ has given us throughout his word, and we did not exhaust that. But it disgusts Christ, this lukewarm Christianity. Number two is that it causes one to become deluded because of unbiblical assumptions. Verse 17 says, Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Here's a church that is spiritually waffling, spiritually back and forth and back and forth. I'm like the world, I'm like Jesus, I'm like the world, I'm like Jesus. And by the way, they probably had plenty of the world in that church because the world doesn't mind the waffling. If you can go to a church and not have to become a member of it to go and serve in leadership or not have to attain to a certain amount of standards to be in leadership or you don't have to... Uh, you just keep doing this, that, or the other, and feeling good, and feeling good, and feeling good, and you leave the building feeling good for a time. The world loves that. They eat that up. That's why the church houses are full today. In this church, no different. You get the idea because they said, I'm rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing. God must be happy with us because look at everything that we have. We don't need anything, but Jesus says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Remember we studied that they're wretched. Wretched means they're in the midst of toils and troubles. The worst affliction someone can ever be in is when God allows you to be blessed in your sin. The worst affliction you can have is when you are blessed in your sin. You can write that down, take it to the bank. It is true. 
Because you're tempted to look and say, look what God's doing for me. You're not criticizing yourself, judging yourself and saying, I need to get right with God. I need to stay right with God. I need to be in an ever-present state of revival. Oh, look at that in the Bible. Yeah, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but God is blessing me. So it must be okay. That's how most of so-called Christianity acts today. We're all good. I guarantee you the Catholic Church thinks that. We're good. Look how much money we have. The Lutherans, the Methodists, the more. Oh, we're all good. Look at how much we, look at our opulent edifices. Even the Baptists, yes, even the Baptists. Look at our opulent edifices. Look at everything we've constructed for Christ. Look at everything we've gilded with gold. And they don't stop to think about, is what I'm doing lining up with God's word? Is what I'm focusing on Christ? Or is it numbers, money, power, influence? This church was wretched. They were miserable. Christ says miserable means to be pitied. To be pitied. Not to be stood in awe of. Not to be congratulated but to be pitied. Why? Because though they had earthly goods, they were spiritually poor. Christ was disgusted with them. And he goes on and says, you're poor, the destitute of wealth. They may have had lots by way of earthly rich, excuse me, by way of earthly riches, but they had not much by way of spiritual things. Godly people love God's word. It does not matter where you look. Hagerstown, Maryland, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Greenville, South Carolina, Pensacola, Florida. That's where we all have people. That's what's at least on my mind right now, those four main places, there is a dearth, a famine of a desire for God's word. Oh, there's plenty of religion. Plenty of religion to go. There's always, folks, been plenty of religion to go around. But you sit down with people you get to the heart of the matter, you find not many want the word of God. It's sad. Yeah, it should break our hearts. It should break our hearts. And that's why we should love the word ourselves, follow after it, and pray that those that we love will have a love forward to because only God can give that desire in the end only God can give it you only love the word because God has given you a love for it not because you and I are such great people but because God has given us a love for it it's out of his grace he's changed us he's made us to be different it's part of being that new creature they were poor they were also blind or without sight. And this all ties in together. They were without sight. And sin causes blindness. They said, we have need of nothing. Christ says, you have need of everything. I mean, you think about the insanity of the blind man running around saying, I can see, I can see when he's blind. That's what we have today, is the blind leading the blind, and both fall into the ditch. And Jesus says, you're naked. You're without clothes. It, it, it goes to the, the, there's a proverb or parable called the emperor's uh, clothes and what have you. But it's the insanity 
of a naked person running around saying, look at how great I'm clothed. Look at my clothes. That uh, was this church. I don't have need of anything. But Jesus says, you've got need of clothes. <laughs> you say, that's craziness. It is craziness. Sin is insanity. I couldn't tell you how many times Sarah and I have said that to each other over and over and over over the past several years. It's true. You say, why does the country do what they do? Sin is insanity. Why do people do what they do in our families, amongst our friends? They're unsaved. They're away from God. Sin is insanity. People are only focused on one thing when they're away from God, when they're lost in their sin, and they're focused on just themselves. What makes me feel good? Remember, if they do help someone, they likely have a selfish goal behind it. I'll help you, but so I can get something out of it. Maybe so I can hold it over your head and get something out of it later on. That's not Bible Christianity, is it? We help each other because we love each other. Not so we can get from each other. Not so we can say, you owe me 10,000 favors and I'm cashing in that. No. No, it's not about that. That's not godly love. They were insane in their sin. They thought they had it all, and they were missing it. They were missing it. So we see that it makes people to become deluded. It disgusts Jesus Christ. We come to number three, and we see it will be chastened. There were no doubt, as in some of the other churches. Remember, this is a church. Jesus calls them a church. He says there are at least some of his flock in these churches. So it's not, people like to skepticize and say, well, they're, th these people are unsafe. No, no. Christ would not address them as a church if they were unsaved. There's at least some people in the church of Laodicea, just like at Philadelphia, just like at Smyrna, just like the others, that are saved. That are his flock. And we know this too because Christ says, as many as I love, in verse 19, I rebuke and chasten. God only chastens his own. So there are those in this church, in the church at Laodicea, just like in any given assembly. Now, I'm not going to look at you and say, well, this church and that church and the other church, it's all unsaved people, it's all saved people, and what have you. I mean, I can tell you if you go to the Catholic Church and believe the Catholic doctrine, you're not saved because the Catholic doctrine is not Bible doctrine and does not promote Christ or God's way of salvation. So you go to the Catholic Church, you believe the Catholic doctrine, you can't be saved. It doesn't work. You can say things like that, but you ultimately can't say because this person has a button on the back of their head that says they're saved or not, that... This is how it is. These churches did have some saved, some unsaved people in them. He says, this wishy-washiness will be chastened. And if you and I, I mean, we, ha we have a choice. We say that we're saved. If we choose to waffle back and forth, we choose to be wishy-washy. We know what we should be doing, and we don't do it. We are going to be chastened. That's just a fact. So... We can choose to live a miserable life, being chastened the rest of our lives, or we can choose to do what's right. 
and God will stop chastening us, right? So, he says it will be chastened. There's the promise of chastening, which is in verses 15 and 16. He says, I will spew you out of my mouth. I will spew you out of my mouth. I, I will uh, separate myself from you. This is not that they lose their salvation. We cannot lose our salvation. But they would lose their reward. As far as those things, as far as my study of the Bible thus far, maybe someone's done a far greater study on it, but as far as my study on the Bible thus far in my life, as far as such things like losing reward, we don't really know what that entails. The Bible does seem to put forth that if you do not follow Christ, you will not rule with him in the kingdom. He talks about the being cast out where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I believe that part of that crowd are those that regret their life on earth. There will always be some regret that we will in eternity, no doubt, say, I wish I would have done more. No doubt. I mean, people like Spurgeon and Moses will say, I wish I would have done things differently or more. That is no doubt. But there are those like Lot... There are those like Lot, right? They made their choice to live like Abraham or live like Sodom. They made their choice to live in Sodom and effectively condone the terrible things that were being done there. We all have choices to make throughout life. It's not just one single choice. If you want one single choice, it is the choice to follow Christ or not. But we all have many choices throughout life to choose Christ or not. With this, with that, with the other. This opportunity that God brings. This, that opportunity. This time I should have spoken up but didn't. That time I should have gone and helped someone because they needed it, and I knew it, but I didn't. That time I should have warned somebody, but I didn't. We all have choices to make. If we choose Christ, oh, we'll have some trouble on this earth, make no doubt about that, but there will be reward in heaven, and part of that reward is ruling with Christ in the kingdom. I can say that because I can't really say anything else except eternal life. <laughs> the Bible's not very clear. It says certain things like in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. I don't know that these are literal things. But 1 Corinthians 3, 3 and verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, I can't believe those are real, literal things. It's a, a picture that Paul's putting forth. He says, Every man's work shall be made manifest. That means it will be revealed. For the day shall declare it. Now there is an uncertainty there. Will it be just you and God or will it be you, God, and everybody else? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. It's bad enough, though, that it's just us and God that we have to stand before him and answer for what we did or didn't do. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire being that of God's judgment, and God's judgment is just. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Did you do it? Not even did you do it for Christ. Did you do it for Christ according to his word? 
It's not about doing it for Christ. There will be many in that day that say, Lord, Lord. Remember, the people do many things in the name of Jesus. Some many bad things. Some many very anti-biblical things. It's not just doing it for Christ. It's doing it according to his word. Nadab and Abihu wanted to run and offer strange fire before God out of their emotionalism. They were so excited that they saw God's fire. Uh, uh, they saw the things that they saw. They got so excited they forgot themselves, did not do things God's way, and they died. Uzzah was very excited that the Ark of the Covenant was coming back to Jerusalem. They put the Ark in a cart. It became unstable. Uzzah reached back, touched the Ark of the Covenant. He had good intentions, no doubt, but those good intentions were really bad ones because they did not obey the word of God. God takes his word seriously. So I have to say anymore, it's not even doing it for Christ. It's, is it being done according to God's word? Because this is the handbook, not our heads or our hearts. <laughs> So why do you do what you do? Well, I just love so-and-so. Well, do you really? Should you really be helping so-and-so if they're sinning against God and away from God and all we're doing is helping them in their sin? Or are we helping righteous people to do what's right? There's a difference there. And that's a vast one. We'll be judged for it. A great many things, I'm convinced of this, a great many things people think they're going to get reward for. And I look at things I've done in the past too that I thought I was going to get reward for too. And I probably won't. Because it wasn't an obedience to the word. God's going to judge all that. And there's not going to be any, but God, you don't understand. Oh, try, try arguing with God a bit. Try that a bit. It might work here on earth. It doesn't work with the Almighty. His judgment is just. And he says, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. What is it? I don't know. We see certain things alluded to us. But we don't know for sure. We just know it's going to be good, whatever it is. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by a fire. So you see, you don't lose your salvation. This is the, what we call the judgment seat of Christ. You don't lose your salvation, but you can lose your reward. Those are the lots of the world. So we have to be careful because we can lose reward. So there's the promise of chastening in verse 15 through 16. And then we come to the purpose of chastening in verse 19. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. See, the world will say, well, any sort of correction is terrible. Don't you dare correct that child. Don't you dare correct that person. Don't you dare judge them. Don't you dare, don't you dare, don't you dare. And the world is full of its hypocrisies and double standards with that, too. Because, folks, as we've said, it's impossible to avoid judging, discerning. Everyone does it. Everyone's going to do it. The key for the Christian is we judge righteous judgment, not hypocritical. But the world says, don't you dare correct, don't you dare, when God knows we need it. God knows our hearts are desperately wicked. We come into this earth desperately wicked. 
spiritually depraved, needing correction. Children hate it. Teenagers hate it. Young adults hate it. Older adults hate it. But we need it. We need it if we're going to be made better. And if we simply fight against the correction, fight against the help people tr are trying to give us, we're only hurting ourselves. I can see that in my own life in years gone by where people tried to help me and I pridefully said, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm just going to do whatever I want. And you can probably see the same thing unless you're a better person than me, which you probably are. The purpose of chastening is not to be done out of wickedness. It's not to be done to abuse individuals if it is done biblically. It's done out of love. Jesus himself says about his children, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. But the world does not see love equals rebuke and chastening. I doubt my kids at times see Love equals that I rebuke them at times. When my wife and I just try to help them to be better and not have to struggle with the things we struggle with, right? First Corinthians 11 clearly shows us that God only chastens his children. He does not chasten the goats. He does, does not chasten the children of the devil. They're not his children. I will say again, you read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 31 through 33, he only chastens his own. You say, why is the world not suffering when they're so wicked? That's why. It's the main reason. You're not going to go about disciplining other people's kids, are you? You might get in trouble if you do that. God does not chasten those that are not his. And he does this for the purpose of our repentance. Hebrews 12, verse number 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. And, and, and again, folks, this is a whole, uh, I talked to the preacher about this the other day. This is a whole thing with our country. And, and it's no wonder because it is our heart. Our country is full of pride. And we, we are full of pride too as part of people in our country and as human beings in general. We have a flesh. We're going to fight against it the rest of our lives. We have to today, tonight, now, now, if you, if you make no other decision tonight, make the decision to work to be humble. To work to be humble. That means accept correction, accept criticism. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's hard. We don't like to hear that we did wrong or that we are wrong or that we don't know everything. We don't like to hear those things. It smacks against our ego. But we need it. If we are to follow Christ and go anywhere with him in our lives, we need humility. To stop looking at God and saying, God, you don't understand. God, yeah, I see it there, but I'm not going to obey it. God, I know Jesus died on the cross for me, but I really just don't care. That's what people say when they make excuses before God and don't obey him. Right? We, we talk to the teenagers about this. 
I've been there too. Teenagers don't care because teenagers aren't taught to be humble. Teenagers don't care that, that the adults uh, give them food, give them clothing, give them shelter, take them to work and back and 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 don't charge them a cent for gas. They don't care that they get access to the internet for free, that they get so many th free electricity, free heat, in some cases a kitty cat or a puppy dog to pat on the head once in a while. They don't care. And if you're not a teenager here tonight, you didn't care either, neither did I because we weren't taught humility. Now our parents did their best, but we become hard-headed. And some people, a lot of people today, we have whole generations because parents gave up or refused to teach them. We have whole generations of hard-headedness, hard-heartedness, pride, where the preacher and I told each other, and we agreed together because we've both seen it, People don't care today. It used to be that you could go to the hospital and people would, because you came and visited them, now you shouldn't go visit someone in the hospital to get them to come to church. But people would, because you visited them, they would come to church. You go to the jail, visit someone, they get out, they would come to church. You go do something for someone, they would come to church. People don't care today. Because of pride. Why does God chasten us? Why does he take us through the ringer? Because we're full of ourselves and he's trying to get us to care. Do you care that Jesus died on the cross for you? That he rose from the dead? If so, we ought to do our very best despite the hardship that comes upon our lives. To follow him. That's why he chastens us. That's why he takes us to the woodshed over and over and over and over and over again. That's why he makes our lives miserable at times. And we know that we're in sin. Or worse yet, we become deluded like the church at Laodicea. And they needed Jesus Christ himself to come and say, hey, listen, you that think you're okay, you're not. <laughs> you need to get right. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. You know, there's a whole, well, God's just mean, and he just doesn't like me. No. If you are saved, there is never a day that God stops loving you. There is never a second that God stops loving you. There is never a time that God becomes this grumpy old geezer up in heaven that just wants to pour down vengeance upon you. That is not God. God, out of his love, wants us to be What's the, what's the phrase today? The best version of ourselves. <laughs> and the best version of ourselves is Jesus. That's why God works on us. But there's people so focused on themselves and their pleasure, and I just want to have it my way, so I'm just going to whine, and God's so mean. No, he's not. You have a false image of God. For who the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. If God hated us, he would not chasten us. I say again, if God hated us, he would not chasten us. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he received. Why, why did I, years and years ago, when Jimmy got a lot more spankings, why did I do that? So I wouldn't have to give him spankings now. So he wouldn't, and Andrea and Phoebe. 
Why did he get some worse than others? So he would see the severity of that sin because I didn't want him mouthing off to his mother when he's 16 years old. I didn't want him slugging his sister when he's 16 years old or his sister slugging him. See, it's not just you. The Bible says, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. What's the purpose of correcting your children? So that they will respect others. What do we lack in our day because of the psychologists like Mr. Spock and the other one I can't remember? Why do we have such disrespect? Because parents stopped correcting their children. They started wanting to be friends with them. No, you can be friends with your children after you teach them to respect you. Not before. Not before. Reverence. If parents don't teach children to respect them, those children will not respect the people they work for. They will not respect the people in authority in the church. They will not respect the people in the government. And what do we see today? I could tell you story after story about these things. Right? And you could too, if, if you're honest. There's no respect anymore because it has not been taught. Just like the preacher told me, and I agreed the other day, that people don't know their Bibles today. Why? Because the Bible is not taught. Platitudes are taught. Self-help sessions are taught. The milk of certain things are taught. But the Bible is not taught. And so we have congregations full of People that don't know God's word. Many of them going out to become pastors and missionaries. Yeah. That doesn't end well, does it? We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of Spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. That doesn't mean that they enjoyed it. It means they did it the best that they could. But he, God being the perfect father, he for our profit. And God knows what we need and when we need it, by the way, that we might be partakers of his holiness. You see the goal there. That we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You say, isn't there any other way to instill respect, reverence, righteousness into people? No, not according to God, because we are full of ourselves, because we have a flesh, and thus... We need from time to time to be corrected. Shown that we don't know everything. Shown that there are people smarter than we are. Shown that we should respect those in authority because they are in authority. And how much more the God of heaven 
who is the Almighty. See, God chastens so that we will become righteous. It's a guaranteed thing to the disobedient. Lastly, it must be repented of. We might go a few minutes over, but we're going to finish this up. It must be repented of. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, back to verse number 18. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. This lukewarm Christianity must be repented of. This is real revival, folks. Not the dancing around and shouting and nonsense that's going on in our day. Revival is a recognition of sin, a repentance of it, and a determination to follow Christ afresh. That's real revival. So three things very quickly under this. One is that Christ counsels the church to do certain things. He says, I counsel thee. Literally, he says, I'm giving you advice. Uh, Jesus gives us advice. We would do well to take it, right? But we have his advice in his word, and many people can only just say, yeah, but. But he counsels this church. He gives them advice. Three things there. One is buy of him gold tried in the fire. It's talking about trials of purification that First Peter talks about. Troubles and trials purify us. They go with the Christian walk. We should not think it is a strange thing that a trial comes our way. It's God seeing what we are made of. God making us to be more like Christ. Buy of him gold tried in the fire. Put on white raiment. That you probably know what that is. That is righteousness, purity, Revelation 19, 7 through 8 talks about those white robes that the saints put on, which is righteousness. Well, how do we become righteous? We trust in Christ. We walk with him according to his word. Put on white raiment. Then it says, anoint your eyes. He says, you're blind, but you can anoint your eyes. You're naked, but you can put on white raiment. You're poor, but you can, you can get gold tried in the fire. Anointing their eyes is talking about understanding. 1 John 2, 18 through 29 speaks of the Holy Spirit that gives us understanding if we want it. We have it available if we want it. People say, why don't I understand this? Well, one, are you saved? And two, do you really want to understand it? Because we don't read the word for recreation. We read the word to apply it to our lives. Christ counsels the church to do these things. And he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be zealous means take it seriously. Jesus takes these things very seriously. We ought to also... Again, the preacher and I talked and we said, people don't take the ministry very seriously today. No, they don't. People don't take church seriously either. And a big part of that is because the preachers don't take it seriously. Oh no, we, take the, we need to take the word. See it for what it says, apply it to our lives, take it seriously. You say, well, no one else in my family does. That doesn't matter. You be, you be the individual that does. You be the one or two people, the one, two, or three people, however many it is. You be the one that does. Because that's what Christ has called us to. 
Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And then the last thing, verse number 20, he commits to fellowship to those that obey him. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. How many times do we hear this in regards to salvation? I stand at the door. Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. No, this is not talking about salvation. This is talking about revival. Revival. Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. You and I know what we need to do to get right with him. You and I know what steps we need to take to do what's right. He's knocking and he's saying, I'm not going to stop until you answer. Sometimes he has to take a torch to that door and chastise us, not burn the door down. Chastise us keeps knocking. And he says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. It's talking about communion and fellowship. This is not talking about salvation. The church is already saved. It's talking about revival. Christ says, if you get right, if you will repent of your sin, hey, we're going to have a better time of it. Instead of locking me out and just doing your own thing. Lukewarm Christianity disgusts Jesus Christ. It is worthy of him separating from those that cater to it. Thus, he appeals to those that call themselves Christians to heed his counsel and commands, proving their very salvation while promising to commune with them. Father, I pray you'd speak to us this evening and help us to be willing to take the steps we need to further our walk with you. Well, thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Any prayer requests tonight?